I think the first part of what you said is really, really important. And that's take it to supervision. Yeah. It becomes very hard or challenging if you don't take this to supervision because you're in your own script. Yeah. Caught up in a script or a negative transference, which is very hard to get out of if you haven't got someone to help you stay an adult. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to <coughs> episode 71 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the ever-present Mr. Bob Cook. That's so- very nice. The topic we're going to be covering tonight is working with a client you don't like. A really interesting topic, this one. Yeah, but just before I go into that, off air, or maybe we're on air, I don't know. You said this is number 71. It is, number 71. And I'm so pleased, because I am 71. I'm 72 in next month, but I am 71 at the moment. So I've done an episode for every year of my life. You have. What an achievement. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just great to hear. So this is a this is an interesting one, working with clients that you don't like, because in supervision it comes up a lot. Um, yeah. um, of course, in my career as well, uh, it came up quite a bit. But people, ther- you know, therapists are often bringing that this subject to me. So I thought it would be a good podcast to talk about about and of course what you're really talking about here is negative countertransference yes that's what in the technical words and people listening to it negative countertransference and interestingly you know jackie there isn't much written on it that is interesting because it is human nature it's part of being a human being yeah in normal life people you know um hit your triggers anyway yeah. In the therapeutic process, um, I think it's very useful to analyze the uh, negative countertransfers before you just say, no, I don't feel I like you or some, you wouldn't say that anyway, but but I'm saying, I think it's useful to take the supervision and analyze negative negative countertransfers, sorry, because then you can go forward from there or not. I was very surprised when I looked at, looked at negative transference there isn't much written about it um and i remember telling or oh, having a conversation with richard erskine uh, i said why don't you put a, a, a chapter on negative you know negative transference and working with it in your next book and he promptly left it out but um there isn't that much written so i can say a bit about it in this podcast why do you think there isn't much written about it bob to be truthful, I don't know. There is some. Don't yeah. get me wrong. There are things, you know, subject is covered, um, but not as not as much or as extensively as other subjects, and particularly, of course, positive counter transference, which I think is covered much more. Yeah. So I think it's a shame because negative transference is something all therapists. I kind of, you know, feel sometimes. Experience it sometimes, yeah. yeah so, Is it because we're supposed to be professional at all times? Well, that's, I hadn't even thought about it that way, but of course I suspect that might have a grain of truth in it. Yeah, I just wondered, because it is something that most of us will experience at some point or another. It'd be highly unusual if you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Highly unusual. And of course, when you talk about negative transfers, or you might want to say negative counter transfers, what you're talking about is somebody who hits your triggers from your own history. Yeah. And um, means that they, therefore you have an emotional reaction um, in the present, even though it comes from your own history. Yeah. I mean, I think the best thing to do in that situation is to take it to supervision definitely yeah have you worked with many clients where you've had negative transfers with 
Um, there's been <gasps> a few on a few occasions. Um, I'd I'd say I don't. I'd say that I connect more with some than others, rather than I don't like certain clients. If that makes sense. Mm. There's certain clients that I resonate more with, and I I connect with better than others. And if you, oh, you've obviously have Jackie, but I was going to say, have you reflected on what that's about? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I mean, if you want to look at it analytically, that will be to do, or we might argue that that will be to do with your experiences of the past. Yeah. So, for example, I'm not saying particularly with you here, but if if somebody came in to my and this has happened. So I'm smiling at myself because I uh, I was thinking about it and look just like one of my uh, abusers from the past. Then, you know, what happened was I had a huh. reaction against that person and projected onto that person a whole bundle of stuff, which actually was nothing to do with them. Yeah. With me, it's been more about the feeling that I get with certain people <clears throat> rather than appearance or, yeah, I, I've done or maybe even more so than the words that they use. If I just get a certain feeling being around that person that reminds me of something in my past when I felt that way before. Mm. So yeah. that feeling is associated, though, with a time, place, person. Definitely, yeah. Your origin. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes maybe the feeling that I'm not good enough or something like that, then I can get triggered. So are you saying that you can trigger onto a person, um, let's give an example, where they might have a specific parental attitude, which is pretty, say, judgmental? Yeah. Then that might trigger off some thoughts, feelings, or images yeah. from the past. Yeah. Or close to, you know, opening up a different way of looking at things. If they're quite close minded or quite fixed, mm. then I find that difficult. Yeah. And that comes from your past again? Yeah. Yeah. But I get a feeling of inadequacy that, that <clears throat> how I used to feel when I was younger, type of thing. So, yeah, definitely connected now to What's that. happening then if we look at it from a transactional analyst point of view, especially when people bring these sorts of things to supervision, is we're moving. This is the therapist. Yeah. This happens. The danger is that we'll move from adults into our own childhood state. Yeah. And we react in a negative way, as maybe we did all those years ago, to the person that was so negative to us. Yeah. And it's instantaneous as well. That's the thing. It, it doesn't build up slowly. It's, it's an instant thing when it happens. That's what shocked me. Mm. Yeah. So can you see, well, I'm asking you, but I, I, let's ask you this question. Can you see any positivity of working with the negative transfers as a therapist? Yeah. What would you see as the positivity once you've taken it to supervision of working with the negative transfers? Because it helped me work through things, taking it to supervision, and it helped me, um, yeah, in, in knowing myself better and what my triggers were and things like that. And it's challenging. And I think that's okay in the therapy room. It's okay for me to be challenged in the therapy room. I think the first part of what you just said is really, really important, and that's take it to supervision. Yeah. It becomes very hard or challenging if you don't take this to supervision because you're in your own script yeah caught up in a script or a negative transference which is very hard to get out of if you haven't got someone to help you stay an adult yeah definitely yeah so the first if part, you're seeing these clients on a weekly basis it's really difficult without supervision almost it's almost impossible because yeah. you're caught up in your own script yeah so yeah so that was supervision of, is the first port of call. Yeah. Would you ever discuss it with a client? 
Would I or have I? Uh, have I? I don't think I have. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, would I? I think I would. With, I think I'd have to take it to supervision and make sure that whatever I say or share has a clinical benefit for the client. Yeah. Rather than just spontaneously sharing something. Yeah. And that's because of things like shame and uh, and and uh, and projective identifications. The other thing I think is important is the developmental level of the client. So if you've been working with them for years, for example, I think that's a different different relationship to someone who's just come through the door. Definitely, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking. I'm not sure whether I would discuss it with the client or not supervision definitely but whether i would take it in the therapy room i'm not sure i never have no and i can only think that if i did it would be a what after you know a useful discussion with a supervisor and i'd have to be certain in my own mind that it had clinical advantage for the client rather than me yeah um, rather than just being simply useful for me in some way. Yeah. Would you ever refer on? Oh, now I want to go on something else. Having taken it to supervision, uh, talking about it, and, and if I came to the conclusion with the supervisor that the negative transfers was too strong and I wasn't able to stay an adult or at least be... Um, satisfied I could stay an adult then I would refer on yeah How I referred on is another question I might just say something like um you know uh, I think it's important that you work with someone else because there's things in my own history uh which can get triggered here which has nothing to do with you and actually the problem with that is I can't give you the best services yeah again but, so there's no guilt or shame or blame or anything yeah, yeah. yeah. I have done that yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, probably only two or three times in my career, spans over three decades, but I have. Yeah. But I've always faced it that way. Yeah. Because we are only human and we can do all the work, but if, mm. if we're being triggered, then it is again, you know, looking at it clinically, it's only fair if we refer that client on so that they are getting. Yeah, I, I remember one person and it taught me a lot because it realized I hadn't done enough work. Uh, this is somebody who reminded me of my father, uh, with, my, uh, with respect to my father, because if it had done the work and the therapy, then I would have been able to probably work with this person. Yeah. But it made me think and reflect and realize I hadn't done enough work on certain areas to do with my father because I found myself moving into child eager state uh, and it didn't help yeah. the client at all. It didn't help me, but it didn't help the client. No, that's it. Yeah. It's a really uh, interesting topic. Yeah. And I think you, I think you need to, if you are going to refer on, you need to say it in a way um that's really important which isn't shaming and etc cetera, etc cetera. um and do it in a way which is very honest and that is um it's not good for you yeah i can't you know i'm not able to be the therapist i should be for you and i'm gonna take a look at the therapy but in the meantime i need to refer you to somebody who hasn't got the same perhaps history that i've got yeah I think that's maybe why I always have a clause in my contract that we agree to, you know, see each other for four weeks and then reassess in four weeks. Because uh, that, that you know, they're, they're prepared for a check-in after four weeks, whether we're going to continue working or, or not. And it's, it's both sides. Because as yeah. much as we can have negative transference, I suppose they can as well. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. By the way, um, and on a on another level, but similar, and it's still negative transfers. Um, 
I'm, I, I, I'm reminded to talk about, of course, the times when I have worked with people, when, of course, I've had this type of ad negative transness identification, but I've taken the therapy, realized what it is, worked on it in my own therapy. Yeah. I'm able to stay an adult to be able to do the work that I need to do. And it's been very useful, not just about my own therapy, but it's been useful in terms of the relationship with the client. Yeah. But that's happened quite a lot. And, it, and, and usually, you know, when I can see the child in the client or the younger self in the client, I'm more able to stay grounded. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that if I can't see the child and, or, or the vulnerability in the client in front of me for lots of different reasons that... I will necessarily go into negative transmits, but I am more likely, if I can see the vulnerability in the client in front of me, I'm more likely to be able to have uh, more empathy. Yeah. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's an interesting one because I, I count myself as a relational integrative psychotherapist. Um, so how much I would share this it would be dictated by if it's useful for the client. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes in a session, I, I'm consciously aware of having a reaction to what they're saying, not necessarily transference, but it's obviously touched something with me that I've had a reaction to it. Mm. Like, you know, I've I've shed tears in therapy sessions with some people whether that's empathy or I'm not sure what it is but sometimes clients do impact on me more than others mm. well it's an interesting podcast about um I don't think it's a should or an ought but in terms of clinical practice um share weeping with your client for whatever reasons um is that beneficial? That would be an interesting podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I, remember, I remember when I first, some time ago, um, a therapist I really admired and looked up to and been a therapy for a long time. I remember it was a group, big group, and he, you know, shared some of his tears and how it quite shocked me because... I hadn't seen that level of sort of the heart in it, if you like, from that perspective. Yeah. And it shocked me and it taught me a lot in terms of, um, you know, uh, how I'd kept myself away from him, perhaps, because I hadn't seen the heart in him. So there's a lot to it. I think it's really important to discuss in supervision. Uh, but it also gave me the permission as a, let's say fledgling therapist, to be around quite a bit, um, to be able to share feelings, which I'd stop myself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Not, because all, the time, the, not all the time, but you know. No, so. Yeah, yeah. But there is a danger of, you know, one of the reasons I like transactional analysis is because we can bring ourselves into the therapy room if it's beneficial for the <clears> client. <throat> But That's I suppose the, the, the danger is that sometimes do we take up too much space in the, in the therapy room? Yeah, that's the biggest reason that, you know, some, it's to do with you and not them. Yeah. And the other, there's several reasons or discussions, that's why I said it'd be a good podcast, is you could unknowingly uh, elicit, elicit the rescuing side of the client and they move into rescuing you yeah. while doing the work they need to do. Yeah. So it'll be a good podcast to have. And I think that it, whatever happens, it's a, it is a human emotion and a human discourse. And I still think it needs discussing to see, you know, where what triggers have been, you know, uh, touched, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because there has been... I don't want to say quite a few cases, but quite a few times where I've been going through something 
in my own personal life that the client brings that they're actually going through, which obviously is one of those situations that can be quite difficult. You know, when when my dad passed away, I had like two clients that had a family member that passed away at a similar time. So, you know, sometimes the universe just throws a curveball at us. Mm -hmm. I'd been seeing these clients for quite a while when my life and their life kind of went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's at those times where you need to be, and you can only do this in supervision, I think. And I don't think you can do it terrible certainty but i think you can discuss it anyway yeah whether the therapy that you're doing is in service of the client and not yourself yeah you can go after your own therapy to do the work that you need to do i don't think it needs to be done necessarily with clients no you said all that lot there's something very real in the sense of shared humanity yeah I think it was more, well, that's what I did do, you know, but I think it was more how coincidental life can be that we're going through it at the same time. And yeah. I didn't actually take a break from work when my dad passed away. Oh, right. I, I did a lot more personal therapy, but it was like I knew that at least two of my clients were going through a similar thing. And would that have been appropriate for me to stop seeing them? when I knew what they were going through. So I, I do remember it being a bit of a quandary. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one, those sorts of yeah. dilemmas. Yeah, and I think as a therapist, there's always a dilemma of one sort or another going on. Oh, nearly always. I mean, you, you fostered children, didn't you? I did, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, there's lots of issues there that's around attachment and ruptures in attachment that might get activated in the therapy room yeah yeah so there's lots in our histories which can get activated and you're right if the per same person or you know person in the group or individually has the same sort of issue like you've just explained there um it is a really important one to take to supervision so that you don't merge with your client yeah and are doing therapy for yourself rather than actually doing what you should be doing yeah so it's very very challenging when you have those circumstances of possible identification yeah and it's it's understandable you know if we look at your career length of you know 35 plus years Mm. You, you know personally as a, as a man you must have gone through an awful lot in that 35 years oh right you know that you've been a therapist throughout that so you know it's understandable that we are going to go through certain things at certain times oh yes and uh, and we also must remember that people act respond in their own unique ways yeah so even though i may act or react uh, in certain ways to certain levels of trauma or, or whatever we're talking about here someone else might not yeah that's a really good point, that is. You know, if we're looking at grief again, we all grieve differently. There isn't a rule book for how we should cope with... No, because trauma. what you just said yeah. there is interesting. You said that you didn't take any time off work. I mean, you also said you had some therapy. I understood that. Yeah. And then another person might deal with their own grief in a completely different way, where they need to go away and have some time off from their profession and... It's a different process. Yeah. And I've always been taught and believe this, and it's very hard to do. And I think I did it pretty well, but you cannot, you can't do it perfectly. And that is uh, have move away from any assumptions. Yes. Yeah. And that's a hard ask. Yeah. But I'll try to do it. Yeah, definitely. Because we, it, it is again, it's it's part of the human nature that we do make assumptions that you know they'll feel the same way that I felt when I went through it or you know yeah. they should be feeling this way or shouldn't yeah. be feeling that way yeah that that comes up daily that came up daily for me in my clinical career exactly what you're talking about there uh the if I carried myself away with my assumptions 
uh, therapy would be far more challenging. Yeah. And in fact, I don't know if therapy would happen particularly well because uh, my assumptions are <laughs> often incorrect. Yeah. Well, they're based on your past and yeah. your history and things. Yeah, definitely. that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. There might be some mutual relational needs and there well might not be. Yeah. Yeah. The more you talk about topics like this, the more you realise how much of a minefield it is in the therapy room. It's very, <laughs> very difficult. I mean, you know, I had a lot to happen to my own history and I was thinking of somebody I did pass on, by the way. It's not that I didn't like them, by the way, particularly, uh, but they had very identical um, situation to me, very young. And um, as we talked about it, I felt myself moving away from here now reality. And it, I took it to supervision and it came clear that there was still a lot of therapy for me to do. And I did refer on. Yeah. Um, because actually, if I hadn't have done, I would have moved a child and also been caught up with my own assumptions. Yeah. So assumptions are one of the biggest curses, I think, for a therapist. Curse might be the wrong word, but biggest challenge anyway. Yeah, if you're unaware of what it is that's that's going on. Mm. I think this is why I love therapy so much, because you are always shining a light on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a it's a light that has been going on for many, 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 many years in many different ways through therapy and my own reflection. And without that, uh, I could easily have merged many times with the clients that have come through my door. Yeah. And that is a recipe for disaster in terms of therapeutic change. Yeah. The problem, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the hardest things in the early days for me as a therapist was you know being honest with myself and being transparent with myself as you know who am I and sometimes that's painful we we do unearth parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily like you know we learn about making assumptions and you know our thoughts and feelings around certain things or certain people and it's not always pleasant when that comes into your awareness <laughs> no and sometimes our dark sides even Though we've attempted through therapy and perhaps to minimize the dark sides of our own spirit, they may collide or have the possibility of colliding with the darker sides of clients to come through the door where you've got some identification with. Yeah. Yeah. Because some clients come with a specific problem that you, you know, you might think, well, that's a bit close to home. So I'm, I'll refer them on before you even see them. But then other clients, you know, you can be seeing them for quite a few years when something will come up. Well, that, that's a good thing to mention, by the way, that uh, what you've just said there. Now, hopefully the relationship, which has been, you know, long at a developmental level, might be able to hold together long enough for you perhaps to do the therapy or supervision that you need to do so you can stay an adult. Yeah work through the issue with the client and if you can't that's a really big big area to discuss with your client or at least talk about in a way but I think you'd have to go through supervision and therapy to, therapy to work that through because you're right suddenly out of the blue sometimes things occur which um, even though you work with a client for say two or three years and then something comes up you don't expect yeah. An interesting one. Supervision has supervision in your own therapy has to be your first port of call. Yeah. You share it with your client. Yeah. Definitely. Even if you know them very, very well. Yeah. I remember, you know, I think of an instance of somebody I worked with for eight years and she was talking about something very close to home. And I thought oh, I've done a lot of therapy on this. And I was I was thinking about things. She suddenly said, what are you thinking about? You seem to have changed in your manner. Wow. And I realized suddenly that I was somewhere else. Uh. And I said to her, yes, I'd 
what you're talking about was very evocative and I had a sense myself that I perhaps moved away uh, and um, I'll take this to supervision and talk about this for the next session. And then she said, was it about X? And we briefly identified the process. It was to, towards the end of the session, so I was able to take a supervision and therapy. And then I brought it back uh, and said, well, I'm doing this work here and it's been very useful and thank you. And uh, I'm able to stay here with you now so we can explore this area. Yeah. See, I, I think, you know, if I was on the receiving end of you saying that, I, I would probably trust you all the more for for doing that, yeah. you know, because we're not infallible. We're not, you know, robots that don't have emotions and a life outside of the therapy room. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And usually when a supervisor comes and says, I've got, you know, this client I don't like or has arrived on the doorstep, I don't know if I can work with them, uh, you know, it, 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 it's usually to do with their own vulnerability mm. that they push against the client because they're afraid in some ways of being vulnerable with this client. Yeah. So usually in supervision, I would encourage or share the person to uh, explore briefly before they defer on what area what areas you might be feeling vulnerable with this client because it's about vulnerability in the end yeah. it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable in a human relationship yeah therapist clients are both yeah it does and the two always come together in my book you know courage and vulnerability because it's easy to just shut down and not be vulnerable well i think it's it's an interesting word, easy. I think it's a coping me mechanism which has been cultivated. So in that sense, it's easy because it's predictable. Yeah. <clears throat> it's predictable. It's, it's a way that we've learned to cope, uh, to shut down or, or whatever it is that we, the way we cope. Um, so that in that way, it's easy. But I suspect at the beginning when we started to, um, adopt that way of defending so we could survive in a more robust way. It was probably something we had to strive to do. Yeah. But become sort of second nature because we've learned to cope that way. Yeah. It's an interesting one, Nath, but yes, I think you're right that we've learned to cope in a certain way. Um, but I think in you know, careers, anybody who listens to podcasts, you're going to find many clients that come to you that elicit your negative transfers, I'm sure. And take it to supervision and get your own personal therapy, if it does. <laughs> it's the only way forward. Yeah. And, and if we find ourselves not being able to stay in our dark, we do then need to defer in a sensitive way and explain why in a transparent yeah. way so the person feels accounted by you. Yeah. And that you're doing it for the best reasons. That's you have to. Uh, yeah. Be, yeah ab absolutely, Jeff. That you're doing it for the for the best reason for the client. Yeah. I've really enjoyed that one, Bob. Thank you. It's an interesting subject, Terry. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So what we're going to be discussing in the next episode is working with multiple personality disorder. Now that's a specialist a specialist subject of mine. Um, at the end of my training in transaction analysis. Um, and I went on to study in integrative psychotherapy. I, I started to specialize in the whole subject of multiple personalities. It was at the beginning of the 1990s. And it's not so common now because the terminology is called you know, dissociative identity disorder. But um, it's a podcast I, I'm looking forward to. Me too. I've never worked with them and I wouldn't know where to start. So it's a learning curve for me. So until next time, Bob, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.